for the invitation to talk. Um, this is going to be a very uh, clinically oriented talk here. Um, basic idea behind this is can we use brain pulsatility as a measure of intracranial pressure? Um, and so, let me see here. Uh, just a few disclosures here. Uh, one of our co-investigators on this uh, works for Siemens Medicals and involved in the development of the sequence for this. Uh, so the basic idea here, uh, and, and I'm going to do this from a very simplistic uh, clinician standpoint here, is when we're looking at intracranial pressure, we've got a rigid cranial vault, we've got our brain volume, our CSF volume, and our blood volume, and if one of these or more increases to a point that can't be compensated, the pressure will go up. Um, and that the pulsatility of the brain is driven by the, the blood flowing into it, into the intracranial compartment. Uh, now this is, is essentially violated by the fact that it's not a rigid compartment, right? So we have um, the spinal canal, which has neural foraminal bony openings. There's epidural fat. So, uh, in fact, it's not a completely accurate assumption. Uh, clinically, when someone's being worked up for uh, potentially elevated intracranial pressure, they're coming in with signs and symptoms that they have high pressure, um, what we're looking for is, is there intracranial mass? Is there an accumulation of CSF, either through an intraventricular or extraventricular obstruction of CSF flow or resorption? Or is there obstruction of the blood flow such that there is uh, increased back pressure in the, in the, uh, in the venous system? But what we're using here as a model uh, is actually a condition that has none of those. Uh, it's in idiopathic intracranial hypertension, formerly known as pseudotumor cerebri. And this is a condition that um, is seen in young, uh, typically obese females. And uh, really presents with uh, headaches, visual disturbances, uh, occasionally a sixth nerve palsy, uh, and does not have any of those findings on MRI. No intracranial mass, no, um, no hydrocephalus, no venous sinus thrombosis. And diagnostically, what we're looking for are signs and symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure, uh, no localizing neurological signs apart from that sixth nerve palsy, uh, and then a CSF opening pressure of uh, 25 or more centimeters water. And while traditionally the idea has been that there's normal brain imaging, there's a variety of uh, imaging findings that we can look for here. So that elevated intracranial pressure gets transmitted along the um, optic nerve sheaths. So there's accumulation of CSF there, protrusion of the optic nerve head. Chronically, the bone of the skull base can get remodeled by this elevated intracranial pressure. As we can see here, this is the cella tersica that's been expanded and filled with CSF. And then uh, there's this typical um, stenosis of the distal transverse venous sinuses. Uh, that there's a lot of debate about whether that's causative or the effects of uh, the elevated pressure. <coughs> so we wanted to use this as a model because um, the brain is stru structurally normal. Uh, there's not a uh, mass or something that would vary between patients as we look for a model here. Um, this is a disease that's related to obesity, and um, no, this is not the uh, presidential election map. This is actually a um, map of obesity across the United States here. So you can tell we're in a red state, and we have a high prevalence of this condition. So uh, it makes it relatively easy for us to find patients to, to use here. Uh, and so again, basically the idea is can we, um, in a patient who's presenting with signs and symptoms of elevated cranial pressure, Using MRI, can we assess them non-invasively for, um, for what their pressure status is? All right, so um, traditionally, clinically, this is measured with uh, lumbar um, puncture and open <coughs> pressure measurements. So um, spinal canal is accessed with a needle, and there's a manometer hooked up, and we check the pressure. Uh, typically, we'll take off some CSF for sampling and then check the pressure again, uh, measure that closing pressure. And so the idea behind this uh, study here was to use a non-invasive MRI method uh, that's based on um, uh, the sequence called DENSE, so displacement encoded with simulated uh, echoes, MRI. Uh, 
and it's similar to a, uh, a velocity encoded phase contrast uh, technique that you would use for CSF flow, except that uh, it's displacement encoded, and uh, the way that it's set up, it's very sensitive to even sub millimeter uh, displacements of brain tissue. So uh, I'm not going to get into any of the gory details of the sequence because I don't frankly understand them. If there's uh, if there's any technical questions, John might be able to help help out with that. Um, this is uh, some of the typical imaging that we get here with dense MRI. Um, here we can see that there's a lot of motion of the brainstem and the upper cervical cord here across the cardiac cycle. Uh, here it is just color coded. So the purpose of this study was to determine the relationship um, between what we, what we see on, on dense imaging uh, in patients who have uh, suspected elevated intracranial pressure as well as normal controls, and to correlate that in the patients um, when their pressure status is high, so we measure the, uh, their opening pressure by lumbar puncture, uh, when their pressure is in the normal range after we've removed some CSF and dropped their pressure into the normal range, and then in healthy controls. So uh, we had nine patients with uh, suspected elevated uh, open, uh, intracranial pressure. They all went on to have a diagnosis of IIH, uh, as well as nine healthy controls. Uh, they were all studied in a uh, 3T uh, Siemens MR scanner, a TRIO scanner, um, with uh, peripheral pulse <laughs> unit gating, uh, so it's cardiac gated. And the sequence itself is a single slice mid-sagittal image. Uh, so here's the setup based on a 3D T2 weighted scan here. So uh, this is the approximate field of view. It's a uh, six or seven millimeter uh, slice that's positioned to go uh, mid-sagittally through the brain stem and upper cervical spinal cord to uh, prevent any partial volume effects with the CSF around it. And this is, uh, this is basically the, the protocol here. So. All the patients uh, underwent uh, MRI, including dents, and then within 60 minutes, uh, which was the target, we were sort of on average about 30 minutes or so, uh, they went to the fluoroscopy suite, had a lumbar puncture uh, done under fluoroscopy. We checked the opening pressure using CSF manometry. Um, we lowered that pressure down into the normal range by taking off CSF, and then we measured the closing pressure and then within 30 minutes, uh, got them back on the scanner to, to repeat exactly the same sequence, same parameters. Um, so we reconstructed the images offline and we placed some regions of interest, uh, just for simplicity's sake here, uh, within the central ponds. Uh, so a relatively large structure, uh, an area that from prior studies uh, we knew uh, tended to have a lot of pulsatility so if we look uh, supertentorially, there tends to be not much pulsatility, in, particularly in the head to foot direction, uh, whereas the posterior fossa structures, the pons, and then the upper cervical spinal cord uh, tend to pulsate a lot more craniocaudally. So uh, we focused on that structure. Uh, and then we basically looked at the effects of being pre-lumbar puncture, being post-lumbar puncture, uh, or being in control and then the effects of what the pressure was on the measured um, displacement using dents. So these are just some sample images. This is the, the ROI, so standard size ROI. Uh, we placed it on the magnitude images uh, from the dense sequence, uh, so we had a consistent anatomy in the central ponds, and then transferred that to the, uh, to the phase images from the dents. And then here's an example if we plot the uh, displacement out over the cardiac cycle. So here's uh, the same patient pre-lumbar puncture. And if we look at this in terms of where the uh, displacement starts out and where it ends up versus post-lumbar uh, puncture, where we can see that there's a much greater excursion here, uh, this is what we're measuring here. So the, basically the maximal excursion in, in the um, position of the brain tissue in that voxel in the pons. And, um, and basically we're comparing the pre and post lumbar puncture in each of these patients. So 
Um, our results here, so each of these patients did uh, wind up having a diagnosis of um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. There were no intracranial abnormalities. There's no mass or hydrocephalus there. Um, the, all patients had elevated intracranial pressure. The median was 36 centimeters water. Um, and we lowered that to uh, 17 centimeters water, so over 50%. Uh, and we removed, on average, about 15 cc's of CSF. And so this is in the normal range here, around 17. Uh, just a sample patient here. So this was a um, patient with an opening pressure of 46 centimeters water um, before the, right after the LP. Uh, sorry, the dense is right before the lumbar puncture. And we can see that there's not much of a difference in the, uh, in the peak displacement here in the pons relative to some other parts of the brain supertentorially. And then post lumbar puncture, when we've dropped the pressure down into the normal range, 19 centimeters water, we can see much greater pulsatility in the posterior fossa structures, particularly the pons upper cervical cord. And this is very similar to what we see in, in the control groups. So if we look at our three groups here, you know, there is some overlap uh, between these, but so this is uh, pre lumbar puncture when the um, average opening pressure was about uh, 34. Uh, here it is post LP, uh, and then here it is for our control group here. So it's important to remember that the controls we don't have an, an opening pressure on them. We did obviously didn't think of it, it was ethical to just do a spinal tap on a on a, a random control, um, but we would assume that their pressure is going to be somewhere between the kind of 12 to 15 range. So perhaps a little bit lower uh, than what our IH patients are post LP. Uh, there's some variability here. So uh, most of the patients, we had a very uh, tight coordination between the lumbar puncture and the MRIs. Some of them, it uh, stretched out to maybe like an hour or so. So um, perhaps what we're measuring with dense was not quite exactly uh, coupled tightly with what we're measuring pressure-wise. Uh, I think that's particularly true post-LP because the pressure, the CSF is going to reaccumulate and that pressure may be higher than what we measure it at. Uh, once the patient gets to the scanner 30 minutes later. Um, and then if we just take all of our uh, data points here with um, the dense data, uh, the maximum displacement that we measure in these, in these patients, and then the measured um, pressure, either opening pressure or closing pressure, uh, we do see that relationship here uh, that as we get to higher pressures, the maximum displacement that we measure using dense does decrease. Um, is this useful given all the overlap between the groups? Uh, probably not uh, diagnostically to get a specific pressure, but within a, a particular patient, you can imagine this might be useful um, if they come in and, and they've got suspected high pressure and you know what their pressure status is based on this, what their uh, brain displacement is. And if you're following them over time, if you're, they're being treated, uh, if they've got a recurrence of symptoms and you want to have an estimation of what their pressure is like, uh, potentially something like this could be useful uh, non-invasively. Uh, the sequence itself is pretty fast. It's about a, a two-minute sequence, um, so it, it's very clinically uh, feasible to do this. Post-processing is, is very straightforward. It just takes a few more minutes as well. Um, so, anyways, in conclusion, this was our... Uh, experience using this technique uh, to, to look at um, a non-invasive way of assessing intracranial pressure. I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, have you tried then to, to do the same technique after like two days or three days to see what happens? Because, you know, there, there is a yeah, no, we, um, that's a great idea. We, for, these patients are coming in as outpatients uh, for their with the lumbar puncture and the MRI. So we've, they kind of come to us and then, uh, and then go away. But I think that would be very interesting to, to, to try that out. And also to start the same after and post the um, stand placement. Yes. Yes. So, because if this is work, then it's great. And, and uh, I have another question. So do you measure like the perpendicular, so which kind of the magnitude yes. gives you the perpendicular movement or 
I so, do understand that. So it's a uh, the the um, it's encoded in two different directions. Okay. So it's a um, uh, there's a phase encode and a um, okay. it's typically head to foot, and then uh, there's the, the orthogonal direction. Okay. okay. And so there's two two D displacements that we can look at. So uh, we we're focusing on the head head to foot, but you could also look at the the A to P direction as well. Okay. Um, but we should talk to that. Yes. So yes. Uh, really interesting. And, and, um, I guess I have many questions, but I'll try to keep it down. I'll just a couple. One is, <clears throat> so let me just understand the experiment. You're moving 15 cc's or so, yep. and you're doing dance before and after. Yes. Did you do CSF measurements, velocity at the frame and magnum, perhaps, or anything like that? Um, no, we were uh, really focused on sort of just CSF volumes and then yeah, yeah, um, yeah. looking at, at, at the that, dance. If you had that change in grain motion, one would think you'd see CSF velocity changes also, perhaps. Yeah, and I'm actually not sure whether, based on the data that we have, whether we could uh -huh. look at the CSF in a similar way or whether... Uh, Just with another sequence. Yeah. We, but, we, so, yeah. I understand your point that, you know, the post-LP, depending on the time out, your pressure can go up so mm -hmm. you don't have a tight correlation. Yeah. Um, and your question kind of covered mine, but it would seem to me if you could do some serial MRIs every yeah. hour for out a ways, then you might be able to capture, see what the change is, and maybe it plateaus out, I don't know. But, uh, I, so really the question to me, yeah. and uh, I'm struggling with is, how is this useful? Because you have to do an LP, That's, that is the diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri. Yes. So, You'd at least have to do one LP initially to calibrate and see, and then what you're proposing to follow the patient with MR? Yeah, I mean, so diagnostically, we need the LP anyways to check the CSF, make sure there's not meningitis or something else in, in the CSF. That's part of the diagnostic criteria. So we're not going to get away from the initial right. LP. Um, the idea is as these patients are treated medically or with, with um, you know, other therapies, I didn't get into the, the low pressure group, but the, the low pressure group is sort of the flip side of that, that coin. Uh, and they tend to get serial uh, pressure measurements because they're coming in and we're not sure if the pressure is too high or whether it's low and they've got a leak. So the idea is once we have a baseline that perhaps this could be useful to see what happens in terms of brain tumbles without doing the lumbar puncture. Yeah, 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 nice. Yeah, thanks. It looks really interesting. Thank you. Um, so to continue with this, so we are actually doing um, an MRI study for the abductor sinus and we do see uh, flow differences. Yeah. So the fact to, to do the LP maybe is not really necessary I mean, in the future. It would be really nice to like to do this kind of study and uh, have like a control healthy values mm -hmm. for the displacement mm -hmm. and do also the abductor sinus study because we do see an increase of amplitude. Uh, like four times compared to healthy case, so I think that's a little bit. Can you uh, can you apply a subtraction uh, between pre and post uh, to see uh, where the impact is the most important? Good idea. Yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't really tried going that route. Um, it's, uh, Assuming they're, they, they should be roughly the same uh, position, but there, there may be slight differences in how they're, they're set up pre and post, so we haven't really looked at that, but that, that would be another, another thought. I don't know if you have any thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. I mean, yeah. all of these experiments that, that you guys are suggesting are great, but these are, I'm forcing him to just do this one scan, and <laughs> you know, I'd like to add, like, oh, all these other 20 scans I'd like yeah. to add, but... These patients are coming in clinically and they're already signing up to do a more than we may normally do, so it's hard to get a lot of stuff done in head position in the big day. You know, go out, we move them on the table, and then they move them back. All right, thanks. Sure.